Hello, my name is Roy Simpson, and I'm a professor of mathematics at Gesundheits River College in Sacramento, California. This is another proof in my series on proofs in differential calculus. This is a proof for Rolle's theorem. Rolle's theorem basically is pretty easy to understand conceptually. Let me go ahead and bring up a page here to uh, allow us to kind of see it. So let me do that. Control in. All right. It basically tells us that if we have a function that's continuous on an interval, and if we know that the function is also differentiable on the interval, and we know one other thing that on that interval from let's just say some a value to some b value if we happen to know that f of a is equal to f of b in other words these two function values are exactly the same in other words these heights are the same then there must be some point in between a and b such that the derivative of f at that point must equal zero so let's say this point is c this just tells me that f prime at c must equal zero there has to be a point where it turns back very easy kind of theorem to understand um, and a pretty easy theorem to prove the prerequisite knowledge for this theorem is uh, that you must know the extreme value theorem that's basically that you have a function that's uh, continuous on a closed interval therefore it must attain its absolute maximum or absolute minimum on that closed interval you also have to know what a local and absolute extreme, what the local and absolute extreme are. So you have to kind of know what that that information is. Local extremes, uh, you must have a neighborhood of existence about those extremes. Absolute extremes, not so. You can consider the endpoints. Uh, Fermat's little theorem is also required for this proof. Basically, just that if your function um, exists at C and it's a local uh, extrema, in other words, either a local max or a local min, and you happen to know that the derivative at that point also exists, that totally implies that the derivative must be zero at that point. And always remember that the converse of that is not true. Just the fact that the derivative is equal to zero does not mean that it's a local extrema, okay? Uh, because you can consider y equals x to the third power as a, a complete counterexample to that. y equals x to the third power as a derivative of zero at x equals zero but that's not a local extrema so there you go so like I said we have a function satisfying the fact that it's continuous on a closed interval a to b it's differentiable on an open interval a to b the same interval and that f of a is equal to f of b those are the things we can assume then we're going to show that there has to be a number in a b the open interval a b such that f prime at that number is equal to zero let's start our proof what we're going to do is uh, suppose that our function is uh, continuous, differentiable, and f of a is equal to b, f of b. So let me write that down. Now that's saying quite a bit right there, but we can uh, see there's a few things that are said here that kind of will help us figure out what we need to do next. One of the things that I can see is that f is continuous on the closed interval a, b. That's actually important because that can be used in uh, many different theorems, actually, in calculus, the intermediate value theorem, uh, the extreme value theorem. So I'm thinking immediately of using either the intermediate value theorem, which just requires a continuous function on a closed interval, or the extreme value theorem. And the extreme value theorem on a, it tells us that if we have a function that's continuous on a closed interval, it must attain its max or its min on that absolute max and absolute min actually on that closed interval and since we're dealing with a, a graph we want to know when the derivative is zero or we want to show that the derivative is zero I might think the extreme value theorem is a good choice here because again it basically is telling us that we need or that we have um, a maximum or an absolute minimum that's going to help out now most proofs that you'll see on this will break this into three cases uh, I am actually going to go ahead and break it into those three same cases, but I'm going to subtly do it. So I'm going to just also suppose that there's some point um, between A and B such that F is greater than F of A. And I just called that number K, some K in, in the open interval AB such that we're above the endpoints. And this corresponds to the the statement that we had earlier uh, that or the picture that we had earlier this one right here where we have some number let's just say uh, this guy right here I'll just bring this down we have some number 
k that when we plug it into our function f, it's slightly above the endpoints. That's all I'm saying. Suppose there's some number that can that that happens at. Now, by the extreme value theorem, our function f will attain its absolute maximum on a b, the closed interval a b. But we happen to know that f of a and f of b are less than some function value in between them. So we're really saying that f will probably attain its maximum, absolute maximum, in between a and b. And this was just me using the fact that f is continuous on the closed interval a b. I can use the extreme value theorem because of that, and we stated that earlier in our prerequisite knowledge. So let's see, since we have an absolute maximum, uh, and specifically since the absolute maximum occurs between uh, a and b inclusive, this absolute maximum that we're talking about is also a local maximum. Remember, you can only have a local maximum if, you're, if you have an open interval of existence uh, around that maximum. And in this case, since we know that our absolute maximum must occur on the open interval a, b, there's a neighborhood around this absolute maximum. So therefore, uh, we know it's a local maximum as well. Let's go ahead and call this local max uh, at, uh, let's say that it occurs at c, comma f of c. Now I'm just going to use Fermat's little theorem and basically say that since we know the derivative exists on the open interval a, b, and we have a uh, local maximum at c, that implies that the derivative at c must be zero by Fermat's little theorem. So here we have that we've used Fermat's little theorem, we've shown that this is true, that f there must be a point between a and b such that the derivative at that point is zero, which basically is what we wanted to show. We want to show that there is some point between a and b such that the derivative is zero. So a lot of people say, okay, we're done. But that's actually not true because we still have some extra work to do. We This was based on the supposition, this supposition right here, that uh, there was a number between a and b such that f at that number is greater than a and b. However, what if we don't have such a number? What if instead we have a number between a and b that's f evaluated at the number is below f of a and f of b? Then by similar arguments, arguments that we've just used in the previous paragraph here, there must exist some point between a and b such that f prime at that point is equal to zero. And by the way, that point will be a minimum. So f of d will actually be a minimum for this function because all our, we have a point that exists below, so we have to curl back up. So this is just covering both cases. We're basically saying uh, that you know we either have a point above or we have a point below. Now, some other people might say, what if you never have a point above and you never have a point below? Well, that's our last possibility. So in, if it's the case that uh, we never have a point above or below that leads to a function value above or below f of a and f of b, well, then we have a constant function. And that basically means that the derivative must be zero. So I would just write that in. So then f prime of x equals zero for all x, actually, right? Because it's a constant uh, function. So it's zero for all x in a, b. Yeah. So in all three cases, whether we have a point above, a point below, or you have a constant function, there's always a point where you can, where the derivative must equal zero. That is actually the entire proof. Yeah.